What are some psychology experiments with interesting results? White rats and black rats were raised separately without seeing each other. When a black rat was placed in the white rat's cage, the other rats ostracized him. When white and black rats are raised together and a new black rat is placed in a cage, the white rats accept him. So basically rats are racist, unless raised to accept differences. I wonder about this one. Rats don't like any other rats that are not from their group. If you keep rats as pets, it's a whole big thing to introduce new rats into your old group. I imagine the results would have been similar no matter how they looked. Also red-eyed rats have pretty crappy eyesight. I'm late but nobody has said it yet. The self-fulfilling prophecy studies are very important to social psychology and their findings have many real-world applications. Basically they brought together a group of kids and formed a class with a real teacher. They gave the kids a test for overall academic skill at the start of the course, but didn't really use the scores. Instead they told the teachers that a few students, picked at random, were very brilliant and scores very highly. They then observed the class for a long period of time and noticed that the teachers gave the kids they thought were brilliant much more attention. At the end of the study the kids took the test again. And they found that the kids who were randomly named brilliant at the start actually scores higher than the rest of the class. The kids, again, at the start didn't score any different from the rest of the class. But through the self-fulfilling prophecy they became the best in their class. This obviously has tons of application in the world and especially education. I've heard there is a similar process that happens in China with people born into the year of the dragon. Predicted to be highly successful etc. The monster experiment. Although it is horrible how they left the children with mental health issues at the end, this experiment gave very good insights to how to parent a child. On this experiment, they took groups of orphan children and separated them into three groups. One was the control, the second were told they has a lips and were doing bad, and the third was told that their speech was perfect. As the experiment went on, group 2 began developing lisps after being berated constantly. They became shy and reserved. They were scared to speak because they didn't want to get in trouble because of their poor speaking skills. Group 3, however, had the opposite happen. They talked better, they were more willing to improve. They were encouraged to keep speaking and told that their speech was amazing and perfect. By the end of the experiment, they had one group with no change, one group with now mentally ill children with a speech impediment, and one group with great speaking skills. It truly shows that encouraging children is the way to go and that verbal abuse can be just as, if not more, harmful as physical abuse. Can all parents be required to study this, please? Not entirely sure it fits into the category but the Rosenhan experiment. 13 people feigned mental illnesses to get into mental hospitals and all were admitted with different diagnoses. They then assumed their normal personalities but to be released they all had to admit that they were mentally ill. There was a second part where a hospital challenged Rosenhan to send multiple fake patients to the hospital and they would rate their patients on a scale of whether they think they were faking. They identified many possible fakers, but Rosenhan in fact hadn't sent anyone. These are my favorite kind of studies. I love it when participants are given power and then lied to lol. The three Christs of Ypsilanti. Psychologist forces three people who believe that they are Jesus Christ to live together. It does not go well. The psychologist, Milton Rokic, had heard of a case where two women who believed that they were Mary, mother of Christ, were forced to live together and one of them broke free from their delusion. So he figured, three Christs, what would happen? They were angry at each other, often had physical fights. They eventually started getting along by avoiding the topic. He would ask them about the others and each would say that the others were crazy. That they, of course, were the real geezers. No cures. Some unethical stuff. Interesting though. I was hoping to find this. The case study was in 1964. And they were all diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia. They were all patients at Ypsilanti State Hospital. And while they didn't live together, they were in group therapy sessions. You can find the book on Amazon and there was a movie adaptation as well. I'm a huge fan of Milgram's Small World Experiment. It is more sociology than psychology, but I still think it is really cool. Milgram sends out 160 letters containing the name and address of a stockbroker in Boston to people in Omaha, Nebraska, 
They had to send it to someone they thought would get the letter closer, but they couldn't mail it directly to the stockbroker. Interestingly, most people that sent on the letter sent it on to the same group of people on the 5th degree. It only took 6 people, hence the 6 degrees of separation, to arrive. On average, it shows how interconnected our world is, even before the internet, which is happy to think about. Whoa, how awesome that milligram is famous for more than one experiment. And speaking of the internet, this is actually how packets on the internet are sent, TCP IP. When you look up a website, the protocol doesn't know exactly how to get there, it just asks nearby computers to get you closer, until you reach the website. Amazing how fast websites load considering this imperfect medium. I loved learning about infant development. My favorite was probably the development of depth perception or perhaps the fear of heights. We're not born with it but, if I recall correctly, we develop it within the first year or so. Scientists created a raised square platform. Half of the floor was wood and the other glass. The actual surface of the floor, one meter or so below, was white with red polka dots. At varying intervals of age the babies would be brought in and placed on the wood end and encouraged to crawl to their moms who were standing at the glass end of the platform. In early infancy baby crawls over there without giving a crap. At some point though they stop at the point where the wood meets the glass, or plexiglass maybe, showing that they recognize the difference in height and the fear of falling. Baby's brains are pretty freaking cool. Reconsolidation. When you retrieve a memory from your long term memory it is susceptible to being manipulated. This can lead to memories being totally changed from the source. This is why eyewitness accounts cannot be fully seen as true. This knowledge is also being used to help people with PTSD by changing the negative memories they have of their particular trauma. You have been banned from Armandale effect. It's not that psychopaths lack empathy, but rather, they have the manual settings. A specific region of the brain lights up when people experience empathy. For most people it's an automatic, subconscious, response. But in a study where they showed emotional videos to psychopaths and non while scanning their brains, psychopaths would only light that region of the brain when specifically asked to feel for the character, while the control participants would light up automatically. One time I participated in a paid research experiment. I was basically tricked into thinking I was drunk. I was placed in a room with two other people and we were instructed to drink vodka with cranberry juice over a period of time while we socialized. After we drank I was placed in a room where I had to read some flashing words on a computer. I felt pretty drunk at this point. When the researcher came back into the room he gave me my car keys and said I was never actually given alcohol. He briefly told me that because I was anticipating drinking for this experiment that my brain had tricked me into feeling the effects of being intoxicated. I immediately snapped out of it and was completely amazed at how I felt. I've done this to younger siblings and relatives that won't shut up about wanting to drink shots. We just rub a bit of alcohol round the rim of the shot glass and fill it with water. 3 deep and Thiel starts snoozing on the sofa within the hour. Solomon Ash's experiment on conformity. He set up a test wherein he would show 3 lines of different lengths to 5 or 6 individuals. I forgot the exact number. Who had to state which line was the longest of the three. The thing is, only the last individual is the participant and the others are actors paid to answer in a specific manner. For the first few questions, they choose a correct answer, but later on they start choosing the wrong one. The participants are conflicted as to whether they will say the correct answer or conform to the wrong answer as to not be judged by others or due to self-doubt of their own answers. In the end, most do conform. It's really interesting since it shows how powerful conformity is in the face of doubt, up to a point that some even question their own sanity during the test. Another variation of the experiment also had interesting results. It had the same setup with 5 individuals with the last person being the participant. However, this time some of the actors say the wrong answer while one actor says the correct one. There was an increase in participants who would choose the correct answer and avoid conformity. It shows how much doubt one can have on oneself when alone, but be brought back to self-confidence when they find outside support. Aaron and Dutton, 1974, Misattribution of Arousal. Men who had just walked across bridge, either steady or unsteady, were approached by a female psychology student. 
proposing to do a project on the effects of exposure to scenic attractions on creative expression. The men had to complete a questionnaire and write a short dramatic story about a picture she provided and she gave them her phone number if they had more questions. Men who walked across the shaky bridge were more likely to call her up because they misattributed the arousal from the bridge to the woman. TLDR. Watch a horror movie on the first date. What if I see a comedy on the first date but hire someone to mug us outside the theater? Not a psychologist, but the one where given a choice between sitting down doing nothing and shocking oneself, people tend to choose the shock. Ergo, we would choose pain over boredom. I don't know the name of it but apparently two people become closer if they survive through something together. It's not even actual surviving death scenarios but anything that has you on your toes and heart racing, like a roller coaster. If you train a rat to press a lever for C, and then put it in a box with only that lever, it will press that lever as much as you'll allow it. The rat will stop eating and drinking and just do C. If you train a rat to press a lever for C and then put it in an enriched environment egg, other rats to play with, toys, place to explore, where it could still press the lever for C, it may press the lever occasionally but not as frequently as its counterpart in the dull environment. These findings were a big deal in the behaviorism world because they put a lot of previous results into context and help explain the link between poverty and drug use. Dunning-Kruger effect is one of my favorites. Basically, people with less expertise in a field will overestimate their abilities in the given field because they don't know enough to see the limits of their expertise. At the same time, experts tend to underestimate their abilities because they know too well what they don't know. The phenomenon has, among other factors, been linked to anti-vaxxers, who overestimate their expertise, not seeing what they don't know, with dire consequences. Or every online game ever. There was an experiment to measure the dopamine, i.e. happiness hit your brain takes when eating something you're craving. The dopamine builds with the anticipation and peaks right as you take the first bite. Then, after the first moment it's in your mouth, the dopamine levels begin to decrease. This showed that many times we are desiring, edited to show the distinction made by poster below, the attainment of the thing more than the thing itself. Guess I'll keep dreaming instead of achieving it lol. The Rosenthal effect, the prejudice and expectations you have towards a student contestant etc. Highly dictates his performance in the long run. Look it up aka Pygmalion effect. If people have the upper hand they will put others down to keep it. An experiment told a class of kids that having blue eyes meant you were smarter, achieved more etc. All of a sudden kids with blue eyes formed their own groups. Things like bullying and exclusion of other eye colors started too. They repeated the experiment with different eye colors in different classes, all with the same results. Split brain studies. One example, by providing differing information to each hemisphere of the brain in split brain individuals, those with a severed corpus callosum, meaning there's no communication between the two hemispheres. They found that people would actually physically grab their own hand with their other hand if they saw it making a mistake. Basically each side of the brain controls one side of your body, and in split brain people you can actually make both sides display a disagreement with the other, which is insane, if you think about it. There's another similar experiment where people with split brains have one eye able to see a picture and the other eye can't see it, then they draw the picture with one hand. While they're drawing the picture if you ask them, they have no idea what the image they're being shown is, it's like they can't see it even though they can draw it. Disappointed this isn't in the top comments, we'll probably get buried. Michael of Vsauce fame teamed up with a group of PhD candidates in the psychology department of McGill for his show Mindfield. They recruited three kids with different disorders, eczema with skin picking disorder, ADHD, and chronic migraines after a concussion. The kids were each told they were going to be the first to receive a new experimental treatment for their condition, which consisted of putting them into a fake, non-functional MRI machine. Before doing so, they told them that the machine had the power to help them heal their brain. Michael even got a bunch of famous youtubers to make fake videos discussing the new technology to make the kids believe it. While they were in the machine, the researchers, dressed as doctors, asked the kids if they were feeling the effects of the machine, and that they believed it was working. They never lied to the kids, they just told them it would give them the power to heal themselves.
All three of the kids had markedly improved symptoms several weeks later. The girl with eczema pretty much entirely stopped picking her skin to the point that she felt comfortable wearing short sleeve shirts for the first time. The mother of the kid with ADHD reported that he was much more calm and not as hyperactive. The kid with chronic migraines went from having something like 5-10 debilitating migraines per day to absolute zero. As shown by the chart his mom kept to track them. Placebos are a heck of a drug. Placebos are a heck of a drug. The problem, like most drugs, is the development of tolerance. Welp, the salmon study. To test a behavioral procedure in an MRI machine the experimenters got a dead salmon to use as a dummy, as it had to be something organic. They were in shock when they discovered that the FMRI was recording increased bold response, blood oxygen level dependent, in the dead salmon when running their experiment, suggesting this dead salmon's brain was somehow reacting to the experiment. This led to the findings that FMRI is not perfect and we should expect a certain level of false positives, highlighting the importance of retests and tighter statistical analyses. I think people are missing what is the obvious case here, zombie salmon. Not quite psychology, but it very cool. Normally, if you try to mix blue light with yellow light, red and green, it turns out as white light. A scientist conducted an experiment where they would shine blue light in one eye of someone and yellow light in the other. The majority said that they just saw the light separately, but some said that they saw a new color that they couldn't even describe. This also works with cyan and red, and magenta and green. Hubel and Vizel inserted an electrode into the brain of a cat and took a single cell recording of a cell in its visual cortex. By somewhat of an accident, they found that the neuron only fired when an object had one specific orientation. This was pretty much the discovery of center surround on off visual processing cells in the V1 visual cortex. Cool stuff. Not so much a psychology experiment, but a finding by retail researchers that if a woman is touched below the waist within the first 10 minutes of entering a store, she will leave immediately. That's why retailers who are onto this finding space their displays wide apart at the front of the store, to minimize bumping. Then they pack the merchandise tight in the back, because shoppers who've made their way back there have already been in the store 10 minutes. Wish I had a link for this. It was cited in a magazine article a decade ago. Research on learned helplessness is fascinating. Researchers would put dogs into shuttle boxes, long cage-like structures that the dog could move around in, and would shock the dog through the floor on one side of the box. The dog, at first, could easily escape the shock by moving to the other side of the box. Eventually, the researcher adds a wall so the dog can't escape the shocks. It just sits there, being shocked without escape. Through this the dog learns helplessness over repeated trials and extended periods of time. Even when the wall is taken down, the dog won't walk to the other side and avoid the shocks anymore. It has become so used to the pain that it doesn't even try to escape when escape would be easy. This research has been used to explain certain aspects of human behavior, especially related to repeated experiences of abuse, addiction, and poverty. It takes a long time to get somebody out of this mindset, and is possibly one of the reasons why people get stuck in terrible situations. For everyone concerned about the dogs, this experiment was done in 1967. It's much more difficult to use animals in experiments like this and this particular one would be considered unethical now. The case study done of Jeannie. She was a severely neglected child that never learned to speak. It became apparent that it is not possible to learn a first language as an adolescent. Hedonic adaptation. Put simply, a person who had just won the lottery and another person who had just been paralyzed took a survey to measure their life contentment. Obviously it was high and low, respectively. However, they both took the same survey a year later and both scored similarly. The point being that regardless what happens to you in life, good or bad, you will always adapt and spend most of your life feeling neutral. Our psych class repeated an experiment where half the class held a pencil in between their teeth and the other half balanced on their top lips. We then rated how funny we thought a comic strip was. Turns out using face muscles associated with smiling, pencil between teeth, made the comic strip subjectively funnier than those associated with frowning, pencil balanced on top lips. Choosing to smile or frown can change how you feel and perceive life. Diet and behavior in children. TL. DR. 
Sugar and sweets don't make kids hyper. I love this one because it's so counterintuitive and every parent loves to tell you how their kid definitely does. Researchers took a bunch of parents and their kids, and split them into two groups. Those who get healthy fruit, and those who get sugary sweets. The kids were separated from their parents for a moment and given the fruit or the sweets. A few minutes later the parents were brought back in, and either told the truth about what they'd been given, or lied to and told the opposite. But the parents and kids were left by themselves with an assortment of toys, and the parents were asked to rate their kids' behavior. What they found is that irrespective of what they were actually given to eat, parents who were told their kids had sugary sweets reported worse behavior than those who were told they had fruit again, irrespective of what they actually had. Given fruit given sweets. Told the kids had fruit kids behaved kids behaved. Told the kids had sweets kids misbehaved kids misbehaved. Not told what they'd had kids behaved kids behaved. The interesting thing is that when you actually looked at the kids behavior they really were misbehaving. Generally being more inclined to screech, throw toys around or ignore instructions. Turns out it's actually the parents behavior that determines how the kids act. The same study has also been done with sugary drinks vs. Water. Same result. Another interesting experiment is the Loftus experiment of fake memories, and the power of suggestion. It's basically about implanting memories of events that have never taken place, or alter the subject's detailed memory of the event. You can quite easily test this eye roll. Find a busy picture of a village, preferably cartoon, and vividly colored. Allow a test subject to inspect the picture for 20-30 seconds and let them know that you'll be asking questions. Turn the picture face down and ask 2-3 questions about the contents of the picture. Preferably easy to answer questions. Was there an X in the picture? Or did Y happen? Also mix in a fake question there. For instance, the picture may have had a skyline, but no sun. If you ask the test subject whether the sun was yellow or orange, chances are that they will create a memory of a sun being visible in the picture, and tell you a color. The Loftus experiment has been used to disqualify young children from giving testimonials and judicial proceedings. And follow-up experiments have included implanted memories of fake balloon rides and parents losing the subject in a mall as a toddler. It's quite fascinating. Research into where morality comes from. They asked people taboo questions like, A brother and sister are alone in a cabin in the woods one night. They are both over 18 and decide to make love once, as they think it will strengthen their relationship. The sister is on birth control and the brother wears a condom just to be safe. Is this act wrong? Or another question was, A woman is cleaning her house and has no rags, so she finds an old American flag, tears it up and uses it to clean her house. Is this act wrong? They created stories like this to give an initial reaction of disgust. They would then ask the participants to explain their answers. Most people couldn't give a good answer, only saying it feels wrong. They then went further and the interviewer would try their best to change the participant's mind, saying things like well, no one saw, no one got her TTC, but participants wouldn't change their original response. The conclusion was that people make intuitive, emotional, split second decisions all the time, and the reasoning, logical, portion of the brain tries its best to explain the decision, but cannot change the initial decision. See The Writer's Mind by Jonathan Haidt. If you are new to the channel, you can subscribe. I publish new videos every day. Until then, check another video. Bye for now.